Welcome to the podcast of data and analytics in business. We will learn from the leading industry experts using data and analytics to solve the problems and create values in practice. We will also learn where the industry is heading to and how data and analytics will shape the industry in the future. Most importantly, how they are preparing their business for digital transformation and disruption in the future. I am your host, Jason Tan, and thank you for listening. In this episode, we have Michael Heller. Michael is the Chief Data Scientist of IBM for Westpac Integrated Account. Michael will discuss with us and share with us a lot about the cognitive enterprise transformation and uh, explain to you what it is how cognitive enterprise transformation is about and how you would be able to use the cognitive enterprise transformation in running your organization and also how exactly that is different to the digital transformation that you probably hear a lot more often. So I think that is really important view to have about the distinctive difference between the cognitive enterprise transformation and the digital transformation and what exactly does it mean to run your organization. Michael will also share a lot of with us about how to build distributed system and why building a distributed system is really a challenging and, and how you can tackle in building that. Michael also, before the current role as a chief data scientist, Michael started his career in quantitative finance. And that itself is where Michael mastered a lot of his domain expertise in terms of the financial services industry and how he actually brings some of those knowledge into his role as a chief data scientist. So especially for those people who work in the IT department or who study IT, I probably this is something that you want to hear from Michael of uh, how, why, and some of those domain knowledge and domain expertise is so important for you to build your career to become a really great data scientist. And if you want to learn how to do that, this is the episode that you really want to listen to. And again, if you have any question for me or Michael, please feel free to send us a message on the link. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this interview. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the Analytic Show podcast. I'm so glad to have you here to talk about some of the works that you do with the quantitative finance and uh, also the uh, data science. Well, Jason, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So I'm going to start asking a little bit about you started your career in the financial service industry, especially in the area of deliberative credit link node and the credit scoring model. And it was at a time leading up to GFC in late 2008. My question for you is how challenging was it for you and the financial markets back? You know, looking back, you know, it seems like a long time ago now. I feel like I'm getting old. But, you know, looking back to sort of when I started my career, it was kind of crazy. I mean, honestly, right? I mean, something like that had never happened before, at least as long as I was old enough to be conscious of what was going on, right? I mean, you had the... You know, you had the crisis in the late 80s where the world blew up and you had the dot-com bubble burst. But really, the GFC was, you know, in in my estimation, those were sort of the toughest times we've seen. We might be going to some tougher times, you know, now. But I think in my memory, that was the sort of toughest financial markets that we've had. Coming out of school, you're a kid, right? I mean, at some point, you're 22 years old or however old you are. You're, You're a kid at that point. And, you know, you don't know anything. So you you come and you think you know everything, right? But but you come out and you get a job, right? And so it was really actually quite interesting. And and I think it helped me in my career for a lot of ways, right? Because, you know, you come out, you get to work, you start doing your job, and then the world starts to melt down, right? Lehman Brothers collapse, Mm Bear Stearns collapse. You had uh, Countrywide Financial in the U.S. just basically went out of business, right? And you had a lot of forced mergers in, in, the, in the financial sector. These were not easy times in, in the financial market. So being in that industry, you know, everything changed. I mean, it was like overnight. All of a sudden, the credit curve went the entirely opposite direction, which changed the entire business that we were doing, right? But it was really an interesting time because, you know, for me, I, like I said, I was a kid. I didn't know anything, right? What I was trying to figure out was, well, what the heck's going on here? And for my career... When these types of things happen, people change jobs, they leave, they, they make decisions about their lives. 
So all of my contacts and my network, professional network, it really sort of spread out very fast. You know, the people that I met that I was working with, well, all of a sudden they weren't working at the same company I was at anymore. They went somewhere else and they were doing another job for somebody else. So I was able to sort of benefit from an expanded network very rapidly. I'd also say that as those people left, all of a sudden there's no one there to sort of run the business. There's no one there to sort of do what those people were doing at at the shop. So, you know, in most instances, they're not going to sort of take a kid out of of NYU and let them manage a billion dollar credit portfolio unless they don't have a choice. Do you know what I mean? So at some point, that's a great opportunity, right? With this type of turmoil, you know, there's actually, it actually creates a lot of opportunity and it gives you a chance to really step up and, and grow up real fast. And so I think in both of those ways, while it was crazy time to sort of come out of school when I, you know, I was sort of like, wow, well, did I pick the right industry? Maybe I should have, you know, done engineering. And right. But uh, that really sort of changed, certainly changed my career. But I, I also think it helped me grow up. Yeah. Looking back, how much do you think that event has shaped your thinking, though, and led to where you are and what you did in the late, later part of your career? Let's, you know, it's hard to say, right? I mean, it, at some point, you know, we all go through whatever we're going to go through. I guess anybody, you know, and this is just, this is just true. Anybody that goes to business school, they all think they're going to be rich, right? I mean, it's just true. If, if you're, if you go to like a top undergraduate business program, all these kids think they're going to be rich, right? And they think they're going to get out and they're going to make a ton of money and, and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, that didn't happen, right? I mean, not for me anyway. I got out and I did okay. But it's like all the promise of the way that things were before never materialized, right? The growth in the financial markets, especially in credit derivative, it was all gone. That whole sector just dried up. I mean, no one was doing credit link notes in in 2008. You know what I mean? The market volume for structured products just evaporated. So people have to retool. They have to figure out what they're going to do, right? So that certainly changed my view and it certainly changed my trajectory, but it didn't really change me per se, right? At some point, I mean, I'm the son of a fishmonger, right? My mom and dad own a seafood market. So that's dirty, hard, smelly, thankless work, right? I mean, I've done that for years and years. And so coming out of school, I've done plenty of dirty, smelly, thankless work. You know, working in an office is easy. So for me, it didn't, you know, I I don't think it really changed my calculus, if you will, but it certainly changed the path that I was on and that I took, right? Because I, um, you know, where I went from Radian, where we were doing structured products to, you know, when I went to credit sites and I did credit research and built credit models to the various sort of places I've been, I very well may have done something else. Uh, I might've never left Radian, right? I mean, if we could have kept writing, underwriting credit and structured products, I would have done well. (laughs) You know, really, I mean, I would have done great. I was doing really cool stuff. Yeah. But, you know, the wind changed and, you know, you got to make lemonade. But I think I learned a lot from these experiences. Certainly, you know, I th- but I think that's the point, right, is life doesn't always go the way that we think it's going to go. But isn't that the point? If it did, it would be sort of boring. Indeed. So you then started two different companies. One is called the Little Brother Project and the other is called Coin Market Group. I found both of them are very, very unique and interesting. And especially perhaps the coin market was pretty much in the crypto space. Can you tell us a little bit about those two companies and what led you decided to do that? Yeah. So I think there's sort of a, a story, right? Is, you know, I, I came out of school and I went to work at Radian and, and we did credit underwriting and credit derivatives and credit insurance and, and structure products. And, you know, it was really interesting. From there, I went and I worked at a company called Credit Sites. And Credit Sites is an independent credit research firm out of New York City. Very good reputation. They, they have a good product and a good business. And, you know, eventually I was sort of commuting back and forth from Philly to New York because I was too cheap to pay New York rent. So my former boss from my days at Radian called me and he said, hey, Mike, I need a, you know, a director of trading for my trading desk. So I, I took that job and I went back to Philly and, and I was a fixed income trader for, I think, just about three years. And that was in my late 20s. But I'll be honest with you, you know, eventually what I realized was, despite all the Wall Street movies and all, you know, all the stuff that I, I always thought 
that would be interesting work. You know, in school, everybody wants to be a credit trader. That's a cool job. I find it's not actually that cool. It's interesting to be able to value some of these instruments and understand what they're worth in the markets, to be able to, to actually put a number on something and, and have someone give you $100 million to go buy it. That's kind of cool. But I also find like a lot of what being a credit trader is, is you've got more information than other people and you're trying to sort of basically rip their face off, right? Is, is I want to buy this as cheap as possible and sell it for as much money as possible and to hell or high wind with everybody else. That didn't really go with my moral compass. And frankly, it really wasn't that interesting anymore for me. So, you know, and I don't remember how old it was, but I know it was in the late twenties and, and I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. So I started thinking about maybe I'll go and do a master's program. And I decided I was going to do that. And I actually, eventually I said, okay, so I've got to brush up on some stuff because it's been years. So I applied at the University of Penn in Philadelphia for the postdoc program. And I was accepted in and started working on some of these ideas of what, what I wanted to do. Well, so I left the trading desk and I, I started to work on some of these ideas. And, you know, I guess starting with what I called the Little Brother Project, the idea really came from back then we were in the U.S. This was when Obamacare came out, right? The whole thing, you know, everybody was, you either loved it or you hated it, but it was right down party lines, basically. If you were a Democrat, it was, you know, we need to do this. And if, if you're a Republican, it was, this is the stupidest thing ever. But the truth is no one read the legislation. I mean, it, it was totally ill-informed. And, and this was, I think, 2011, maybe 2010, 2011, 2012, something like that. And no one read it. It was all just sort of misinformation. You know, you want to talk about fake news. It's been around for a long time, right? People don't do the work. They don't actually you know, they've got a lot of bias. And, and, you know, that bias is something that we deal with in machine learning a lot. But this is sort of pure bias. And you either liked it or you didn't like it, mainly because you had preconceived notion that you're, you know, this is good or this is bad. And no one actually sought to do the justification. So the actual legislation was something like 961 pages if you print it out. And I think the draft bill came out and within you know, 48 hours they voted on it. And my whole thought back then was, well, how does anybody know what this thing says? It's 900, like, you know how long it takes me to read 900 pages and understand it? Like, I mean, I can skim through it and flip some charts, but how do you actually know? Like, if I were to read that, how would I take that corpus and how would I relate that to what it means for me or anybody else? Especially if we're talking about like a broader economy, how would anybody know? Like, quite frankly, they wouldn't. And so the idea of Little Brother, and I, you know, it's a play on Big Brother, because it was supposed to be, at least in my feeble mind, was it was the way that we combat, you know, and, and hold government accountable and hold ourselves accountable and all this stuff. It was very sort of pious in many ways. But the goal was actually to be able to sort of go, you know, train an AI to go through and take this legislation and then map the expected output Right. You know, because you know what all the law says today and we know what the proposed we can sort of map the differential between what today and what this new law is and then try to figure out how that will impact a population base based on, you know, socio demographics. Some point thinking back, like we could make a good attempt at doing that today. Right. And, you know, we've got a lot. We've come a long way since 2010. Right. But I think back then, I don't even think it was possible to do. And, and I don't think it was possible to do well. Hindsight's twenty twenty, but but that's what the goal of Little Brother was. It was really to sort of use AI and science to understand facts or actually use science to sort of break things down so that we stop bickering about, oh, well, I like Obamacare. I don't like Obamacare. Well, who cares? You didn't read the legislation, so you're, in, you're not informed anyway, mm. right? And so the idea was to use this AI to sort of help people actually understand what they meant right? How do I quantify if Obamacare is good for me and my family? And that's something I still think about. I think the idea is a really good one. I think it was way ahead of its time. But going into Little Brother, I didn't know anything about natural language processing. I didn't know anything about AI. I mean, I was a pure quantitative finance guy. I was a risk model. I was a credit guy. Mm. So it, in many ways, right, is, and I guess it comes down to, at some point, you know, I mentor a lot of, you know, what I'll call kids that, that work at IBM or 
somewhere, you know, they're not as far along in their career. Like I'm 37, right? So I'm, I'm getting old. At least according to my 22 year old self, I'm getting old. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I guess the point is, is I studied finance and international business at Stern, right? I thought I was going to be an investment banker or a credit trader or whatever. And you know, eventually I went down the path and I, you know, down my path and I realized, well, I don't actually like doing this. Mm. It's really not that interesting. What about and if, oh, if, uh, well, yeah, let, yeah, well, I'll get to that real quick, right? But so we, at some point, I, I just followed my heart. I just sort of followed what was interesting. Yep. And it's funny to me because little brother was really, I'm a very good self-learner. I'm very self-driven. I'm probably more attuned to teaching myself how to do something than most people because I just like to sort of learn. That was actually my education in data science. And it, it's probably the thing that actually put me down this path to get to where I'm, I am now or wherever I'm going. What I'll tell you about Little Brother, though, is there was no money for that, right? At some point in 2010 or whatever it was, no one was going to give me millions of dollars to go work on some lofty project that wasn't ever going to make any money. There was no business model. And then this is the thing, right? I'm a failed entrepreneur at least twice over, you know, and I've learned a lot from it. But, you know, when you're younger, you're... You don't think about these things. But looking back, right, there was no business model for some. Like, how am I going to get 10 million bucks from somebody to go build this thing mm. when it's not going to make them any money? What are they going to give me the 10 million bucks for? Right. So eventually I realized, well, this isn't going to work. And, you know, at that point I had left the credit desk and I was trying to sort of think about what I actually wanted to work on that could actually make money. And, you know, I'll tell you, I'm, I do have a real love for financial uh, economics. And I have a, a real love for mathematics. You know, I'm, I'm an amateur number theorist. And so when I really started to look at the cryptocurrency market and, and, and blockchain and how it all worked, it was really fascinating to me. I'm that, having trouble oh, hearing you. Sorry, Siri thought I was talking to her. It's okay. so, so I was really fascinated by how all that works. I mean, at some point, cryptographic currency, right, it's at the intersection of, you know, distributed systems. It's at the intersection of uh, cryptography. It's at the intersection of financial mathematics. That's a really interesting sort of space to be operating in. If I couldn't do an AI project in 2011, I was going to sort of be a Bitcoin entrepreneur or a cryptographic currency entrepreneur. So we worked on you know, a number of different things. Coin Market Group, we did form a company and, and we filed for some provisional patents, which were given to the company. And I'll tell you what, man, provisional patents cost a lot of money. And this is another lesson I learned as an entrepreneur is, you know, when you're starting a business, if you don't have millions of dollars in the bank, you need to just focus on the business and not worry about the intellectual property. You know, it makes no sense. Like, I think we spent 20,000 US dollars to get that provisional patent that we got. And, you know, the patent was related to, in crypto land, you want to make sure that no one steals your money, right? You don't want someone stealing all your Bitcoins or, or your Ether. So you have a wallet and the wallet holds the cryptographic keys that you sign the transactions with. That's how you release your money. What you want to do to be safe is you want to keep that wallet offline. You want that to be what we call a cold wallet. That way, no one can sort of hack into your computer and steal your keys and, and then sign all your transactions and steal, steal all your money, right? And we've seen plenty of examples of that happen, you know, over the past 15 years. But that's the idea. So what we developed was technology that allowed you to basically keep the hot wallet and the cold wallet. And then we would, you know, in an air gapped way, we would enable people to sort of replenish their hot wallet incrementally as they, they needed that. So that, you know, the goal was that we wanted to enable high frequency or algorithmic trading in graphics in the crypto space. And there, you know, there's a big concern for, hey, you know, I don't want to keep all my crypto keys on a computer that could get hacked. So that's sort of what the technology that we had a provisional patent for was about. Inevitably, though, you know, this was like me and my buddy. And I was unemployed at the time, right? I mean, I, I had some money in the bank, but, you know, I, I was basically unemployed looking to see what was next. We had no revenue. We had some some intellectual property. And we had a lot of Actually, even today, I mean, the cold hard truth is if I would have stuck around doing that, I'd be very wealthy right now. But when you're looking at it and you're like, hey, you know what? I've got this job offer from a real company that, that wants to pay me, you know, six figures plus to go run credit models and risk for them. 
should I do that? Or should I sit around my family home and, or, or as they say, in my mom's basement, right? And keep screwing around with Bitcoins. Well, we know what happened. I stopped working at, on Coin Market Group and I, I, I took a job working for PNC Bank, you know, running a team of risk models. In the sort of 24 months after that happened, Bitcoin exploded and was worth a fortune. I mean, I, I remember trading Bitcoin at a dollar fifty. Yeah, it, you know, and and at some point it was like twenty grand. It was like eighteen thousand U.S. dollars by by the time a couple of years after I stopped doing it, and it was like, man, you know, that's a kick in the feet. It's like, man, I should have done that. Like what? Like, and I was so far ahead of everybody at that point. I mean, no one was doing crypto back then. It was probably so a, it was uh, sort of two hundred million oh, in your bank account. I would have been wealthy, right? You know, but you can't let that stuff bother you, right? At some point, you just got to keep, you know, everyone's got their path, right? And maybe I'll figure out how to make, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. Maybe I won't. I mean, I, I still have some tricks up my sleeve. But, you know, that that was a definitely a learning lesson, right? Because at some point, I um, it was a great idea. We were We were way ahead of everybody else. But being an entrepreneur is the hardest thing you can do. Mm. Right. Because you're really stretched very thin. You know, in, unless you're independently wealthy, your whole game is you might have the best idea in the world, but you've got to convince somebody or a group of people that your idea has merit. And most of those people, well, but, you know, they, they're very discerning. It's their million bucks. It's their 10 million bucks. Right. So there's a lot of people coming with their hand out to try to get investors. So they've got to sort of figure out what's real and what's not. Well, that's really tough to convince, you know, a shark that doesn't know anything about cryptocurrency to give you millions of dollars to start a business. That's really hard to do. You know, and that sort of, if you're an entrepreneur, I, you know, look, I've got respect for you because you've got to make it happen and you're stretched really thin and, and likely no one believes you and you're not making any money. And you're, you know, a lot of this, what they talk about in, in you know, startup land, they, they talk about ramen profitability. Ramen profitability means that you and your co-founders are just making enough money that you can eat ramen <laughs> and and be profitable and not go out of business. So we think feel- about that term, ramen profitability. That, that's a crazy <laughs> term, but it, it's it's really that's what we're talking about, right? Being an entrepreneur is tough. <laughs> I guess sometimes you probably have to reset to make it. Hey, in certain cases, but I still think that it is important to make the calculated risk in order to make it rather than just taking the blind risk. I want to move on to the next question. That, so with your strong domain expertise in the financial service industry, both from the entrepreneurial uh, side and also the corporate, you finally move into the data scientist role. So this is your most recent role as chief data scientist at IBM for now. So my question for you, though, is for those who study IT or work in the IT department, how would you tell them and explain to them the importance of combining the industry domain knowledge with the technical data science skills? Look, I think that's a, a really good question. You know, you'll find all these stupid Venn diagrams. And I like I could find you one and maybe I could send it to you if you remind me later, right? But when I was sort of younger, and, and this is sort of true about this industry, is you know there weren't data scientists. That was not even a term. That wasn't a job class. There were computer scientists and what we would call quants, mm. right? And I was a quant, right? And that's that's what I was. I was good at math, and I I went to business school, and uh, you know I was a quant, right? And and people would basically pay me to sort of do a bunch of math and figure out probabilities and, and how much money we were going to make and stuff like that. Yep. And there wasn't a data scientist. That wasn't even a job class, right? So what I'd sort of say is it's all the rage today because if you, if you look at all these, the blog sphere and you, and you look at what all, all the job market says, is data scientists make a lot, a lot of money. If you've got to sort of pick a job coming out of school, well, number one, it's an interesting domain, right? I mean, we're talking about doing AI and, you know, it's, it's sexy because it's it's virtuous in so many ways too, because you're supposed to do research and do experiments and it's sort of being an academic, but it's not as lofty, right? You know, it's more tangible than, than academia. I'm going to get paid a lot of money to sort of have people pay me to do experiments and I get to play with machine learning and, you know, supercomputers. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Let's do that. But if you don't have sort of a combination, I think it's really three broad domains, 
then you're really not a data scientist. You know, to me, there's sort of the idea that, you know, you need to be able to do, you know, math and statistics, right? And these are just broad skill sets. And math and statistics, you need to be able to have some, some sort of competency in computer science and data and scripting. Those things together would make a pretty good researcher. You can sort of do tests. You can, you know, set up hypotheses and experiments. You can write some code. You could publish some results. But what are you going to use those skills for besides research? The data scientist is more than that because the data scientist has to be grounded in what these experiments and what these outcomes mean for a business. And so that's really that third sort of sphere. A real true data scientist in my mind, it's, you know, yeah, you should, you should have some background in computer science and distributed systems and Linux systems, and you, sh- you should know how to do math and probability and model development and all the rest of this stuff. But if you can't figure out what that means to an organization and how to use this for a business outcome, then you're not a data scientist. Data scientists have to have that third sphere. You have to be grounded in what it means in business outcomes and and how to, you know, position this work to benefit a company. And whether that's sort of helping the top line, you know, we're going to make more customers happy and and we're going to acquire more customers, or maybe you're figuring out how to do things more efficiently, you're cutting costs, you're saving money, you know, it doesn't matter. But, But at some point, you have to be able to relate this science and this math and these systems that you build to sort of enable this insight. You have to relate it to a business and you have to be able to justify the investment in this research. That's the point. That's where the rubber meets the road, right? If you're not, you're just an academic. Mm. And, and there's nothing wrong with being an academic. I, look, I, I, for a long time, I thought I was going to go back to school and get my PhD. But that's not what it, you know, you could be an academic data scientist, sure. But that's not what it's about. It's about actually driving outcomes and being the sort of lens of reason and being able to justify it. And, you know, and that's science, right? That's the whole point is, you know, for a very long time, organizations shot from the hip. They were not data driven. Even today, you know, people, you know, and we can drill down into these details all you want, right? But even today, right, most organizations are not good at data analytics or data science. They're not. I'd say maybe 5% of organizations are are doing well in this field. A lot of people throw a big bunch of money at something that they don't know what it is, but they know that their competitors are doing it. (laughs) And that's a lot of what goes on in, in this business. But if you really want to be a data scientist, to me, what I look for is Number one, you've got to have a foundation in, in Linux and distributed systems. You need to be able to write some code. I would sort of look at mostly interpreted languages. They don't need to be compiled. So your Python, your Julia's, your R, things like this. You know, you, ne- you need to understand statistics and probability and mathematics. You need to understand linear algebra. If you really want to be a badass, you should understand, you know, nonlinear systems But you also have to understand how to make a business case. And you have to understand sort of, you have to be able to sort of go down and drill into the drivers of what actually influences profit and what what influences loss. And, you know, you have to be able to do these things. You have to have at least some domain knowledge so that you can apply these, these really great skills that you have and sort of derive outcomes that that make sense for your stakeholders. Your current role is the chief data scientist for IBM and Westpac account. It is a very unique role. Could you please share with us some overview of your role without giving away too much of the trade secret of of, of the details of what you do? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess a a couple things, right? I mean, uh, so I'll have to give you the disclaimer at this point, right? You know, everything that I say doesn't represent the views of IBM. They're just strictly my own views. And, you know, I can't give you any insight into, you know, what IBM works on right now with the client, right? I can't, I can't give you a lens into the Westpac business or, or what, 
what IBM and Westpac work on together. That's sort of, you know, private and confidential, but, but ha- happy to sort of elaborate on sort of other pieces there. Right. I mean, so, so let me just sort of talk to some of it, right. Is, so my role is CDO and chief scientist for IBM's global relationship with the Westpac banking organization. What does that mean? Right. So what I tell you is IBM is a massively complex matrix organization, right? And we have lots and lots. I think we've got almost 400,000 people that work at IBM across the globe in 175 countries in the world. And, you know, there are different business lines and different channels and reporting. I mean, it's really complex. You can imagine, but it's like that's a whole city, 400,000 people, right? That in itself breeds complications. So when you, you have a large relationship like that with Westpac, at IBM, we call those integrated accounts. And, and we sort of tier the accounts based on the size of the relationship. So our, our largest, best relationships are called integrated accounts. Those integrated accounts are run as if it's basically its own business, for, for lack of a better way to explain it. And so we have a, an MD managing director, who's a senior vice president level guy at IBM or girl, and they run that account as if it's its own business. They're basically like the CEO of that relationship. Okay. They're going to then have a team of folks. Traditionally, they've always had what we call the CTO for the account. And the CTO is mostly focused on infrastructure systems. So as it relates to so IBM's business, right, is we sell hardware, we sell software, we sell services. Those, some of those services are, are bodies and, and hours, and some of those services are cloud services, like, like software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, XIAS, as they say. So the CTO is generally in, looking after the relationship in terms of the systems and the X as a service type stuff, right? So cloud infrastructure, on-premises infrastructure, the software that we get installed on those things, right? He traditional CTO type role. And they look across the entire IBM portfolio. So they're not married to the software organization. They're not married to the cloud organization. They're not married to the IBM services group. They sit across the entire IBM organization and they look out for what's best for that client. Similar to that role is what I do. And, and my role didn't exist until about, I think at IBM, this role really got created 24, 36 months back. And it was, at least in my view, this role was really created to make sure that, you know, look, data and AI, is, it's a blooming field. And a lot of our sort of growth in, in our businesses at, at IBM is, is related to sort of data analytics or AI, right? Or, you know, the entire Watson line, our high-performance computing is often used for AI training and, and all the like, right? And there's a massive growth in, in those markets, right? I mean, I, I need to look at sort of the stats, but I mean, they're growing at over 10, 20% CAGR, depending on what you're looking at. So these are, you know, this is the future. My role was created to sort of make sure that we aren't sort of making stuff up, right? I mean, at some point, Data systems and distributed data systems are complicated. I could ask a lot of people, hey, you know, w- would you use Cassandra or HBase or Planet Scale DB? Which one are you going to use? Well, there's a reason you'd use each of these, right? Is, you know, distributed systems have different characteristics and they were all designed with different use cases in mind. And so if you're a bank and you're looking for some sort of transactional guarantees, right? Like you want to make sure that, hey, if I approve a transaction, there's actually money in your account, right? How about that? And you need to make sure that, you know, because the internet, it's complicated, right? But it's it's also, you know, people forget that, you know, it was actually designed so well that people forget that it's not like a natural resource, right? But there's lag, right? It, you know, how many times have you had to reload a website because it was taking too long? So there's packet loss and there's things like that. So, so maybe there's actually two transactions. You've got a thousand bucks in your bank account and you go out and you spend 900 and then the next transaction, you want to spend another 500, but you don't have any money, right? So you would have run out. But so, so let's say what happens is you want to go and sort of, you go online, you go to spend this money and you, you do two transactions and you do them very rapidly. 
you can have conflicts in these systems because there's latency in what happens, right? And so you, in certain databases, in certain data systems, you might not have a what, what I'll call transactional guarantees, right? Or you might not have like serializable consistency. And that means like we want to make sure that one thing happens after another in order and that, you know, that we didn't sort of just spend 1500 bucks when, when you've only got 900 in your account. And as a bank, it's actually very important that, that if you do use a distributed system, that you use the right one that solves for that use case. So clients have problems with this, right? And, and that's not even talking to the AI. We're just talking about distributed data systems at this point. Distributed systems are complex. And so just like you need someone to sort of know the cloud infrastructure, my role was created to make sure that, that we get it right for our clients when we're dealing with, you know, data, distributed data systems, or AI. Because AI is another beast altogether, right? I mean, just like data systems are complex, AI systems are very complex. And they're, they're very brittle systems. If you change an input, you know, that's going to affect everything downstream in, in, in your models. And so that might require retraining. You know, it, it could break things. It's very important that you get this stuff right. And IBM's reputation's on the line for that. Mm. So it, my role, and oh, by the way, right, I mean, you could look around and, and look it up. If you typed in, I don't know, IBM lawsuit Watson, I'm sure you're going to find something. But there's plenty of examples where IBM and other people have gotten in trouble and damaged our reputation because someone that didn't understand this stuff at a fundamental level made promises that they couldn't keep. And that affects our reputation and that affects our business. And, and so my whole role was really created to make sure that that doesn't happen. One of the key focus of your current career is the deep learning system development and the cognitive enterprise transformation. What is cognitive enterprise transformation? That is actually something that I find rather interesting and unique. So, I mean, IBM has somewhere in, uh, somewhere in IBM... There's some marketing material somewhere that talks about the cognitive enterprise, right? You know, really what they're talking about is the evolution of becoming a data-driven organization and then, you know, being able to then not just sort of get your data picture right, but, but start to fold in digital transformation and robotic process automation and AI models to operate your business intelligently, you know, and that, that's a journey, right? I mean, it, it's, in some ways, it's like marketing, right? It's like the cognitive enterprise transformation, right? Well, what, well, what is it? Well, it's like, you know, how do we do things more efficiently and more intelligently? And how do we operationalize that? How do we turn that into a real machine instead of sort of these ad hoc, disconnected silos of whatever? So it's, you know, the cognitive enterprise is sort of the way that IBM sort of blueprints that. And it makes sense. I mean, it, there's sort of a number of things that go into it from an IBM perspective. But I, I think really, like, generically, it's really about sort of being able to optimize your business and do it based on, you know, what's the name of your, your company? Data-driven analytics, right? It's, it's that, but it's a little bit, you know, it's, it's, you know, wrap in some robotic process automation and AI operations and optimize your business, right? I mean, that's really what we're talking about. So most people would have heard more about the digital transformation and I must have been myself in Korea. My question is then, how would you explain to the CISU the differences between digital transformation versus the cognitive enterprise transformation? So, the, and this is the way I sort of look at it, right? When we talk about digital you know, a lot of time what we're talking about is, you know, how are you engaging with your customers from a, from a web facing sort of standpoint, right? So you've got, let's say you're, I don't know what, what your business is, but you know, if you're a bank, right, you've got an online banking platform and that is the sort of digital face of your company. There's also sort of the mechanism of, you know, the marketing that you do, that then interacts with, with these folks online and, and the like. And so when I think of digital transformation, I, th I really think of 
those pieces, right? Is your digital marketing, your online advertising, and your your sort of digital, your web presence and the like. So even that really requires a good amount of technology transformation to get that right. You know, there's plenty of companies where, you know, you or I, we've gone to the website and I'm like, man, this is terrible. Like this experience is terrible. It's it's slow and it's not laid out well and it's ugly and man, why would I ever use this, right? It's, I don't want to do this, right? So when I think of your digital transformation, I think that's a big part of that, from at least from a customer-facing transformation perspective. Now, now we could also sort of get into some of the back-end aspects of that, right? Is, you know, a good example I'd say is you've got a lot of people that have, you know, what I'd call scanned PDFs for their record-keeping, Right. Well, that's not best practice, right? You, you want a digital first format because it, it allows more efficient information extraction routines and things like this. So I, I think the digital transformation is really sort of getting all that right. It's getting from the customer facing side, you want to sort of nail that experience. You want that to be seamless, beautiful, interactive. You want that to tie into your, your marketing and, and your customer information systems so that that's all seamless. You, you should know who your customers are. You should be able to target them. You should know what they like. You should be able to customize those experiences. That's the sort of front end of the digital transformation. And I think the back end is really efficient processes from end to end that don't involve things like scanning documents to capture the information, that, you know, digital first, these types of things. I think when we talk about cognitive transformation, we're, so now we've got sort of a digital enterprise how do we optimize that? And how do we do it based on data? So now let's take the data-driven aspect of your enterprise transformation and let's sort of cut down the fat there and make this more intelligent. So I want to start taking you know, the digital transformation. I'm going to add a data-driven element to, to how I'm going to sort of change my processes. So I'm going to change the way I do things based on data. I want to automate wherever I can so that I'm not sort of doing things manually that I could automate. So that's your process automation. And I, I want to do it intelligently so that I have AI to help me make these decisions and, and, and to help me run my business more efficiently and effectively. Digital is sort of, in my mind, it, it's sort of that first step. You know, the next step in my view is sort of a data-driven digital business. I think from there, it's really sort of the AI and the automation together that would layer on top to get you to what IBM would call the cognitive enterprise. So from the perspective of the personalization and customer experience, how would the cognitive enterprise transformation be used to improve these two areas for an organization? You mean, you mean AI and process automation together? Yeah. There's really a lot. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of different places that you could think about using RPA, robotic process automation, or AI. I mean, there's a lot. And I think at some point, it's, you know, it's an increment. Like, there, this isn't a big bang type of thing. So let's be honest, right? As you start to sort of think about how you change your enterprise, the first thing you got to do is take a good, long, hard look at the way you're doing things today. What does the process look like today? Where is it inefficient? So I'll give you an example. When I was in the chief data office at IBM, my role, you know, I did a lot of things there, right? But one of my jobs was I was in charge of the machine learning data classification pipelines for, for the chief data office. You know, we used to have people that would sit there and they would hand label the data. Their whole job was to sort of look at the data and label the columns. That was like someone's, more than one person's full-time job. That's what they did. So not only is that really tedious and it's slow and it ended up creating bottlenecks for how fast we could ingest the data into our platforms, but it's, you know, it's, God, I, I would never want that job. Could you imagine? Look, I mean, at some point that was someone's job. So what we did was we had to sit down and say, okay, so look, walk me through how you're doing this. What are you doing at each step? And so it's easy to sort of build a classification model. That's easy. That's the AI piece. We're going to build a classification model. We're going to get some get a data set that's representative of the universe of data that we're looking to classify. 
we're going to break it down into training validation and test. And we're going to do some sort of, you know, train some models and, and do some data science. And we're going to be able to label those columns without someone actually having to look at it and do it for them. There's an AI model. Okay. We, we built a classifier. And now we want to put that model into production. Okay. So what does that involve? Well, we want to run this model over all the data that's going to be ingested in the platform. And okay, so now we run the model. So eventually you find out, well, how come we're still sort of waiting 60, 90 days before that data is made available to people? Well, then we find out, you know, as we go through the process, you know, as you peel layers of the onion back, what you realize is like, okay, so there's a data onboarding process. There's a lot of emails that get sent back and forth. You know, the models that we were doing were, you know, and I, I view that this is probably the best way to start thinking about using AI is what I call human in the loop, mm -hmm. right? Is, you know, we want to have a human verify the edge cases. So the AI can do the easy stuff. That's where you're saving a lot of time. And then what the AI should then do is alert a human when you've got something that it's not sure about or not so confident about. So you have some sort of a threshold. And then when it breaches that threshold or gets close to that threshold, someone then reviews that. So that's the type of model we were doing for the classification. And what we'd find is, you know, as you look at the process, there's a lot of emails that get traded back and forth. One person is onboarding the data, but then they send an email to Charlie, and then Charlie sends an email to Pete, and then Pete sends an email back to Charlie. And all this stuff really, I mean, if we're talking about automating a process end to end, all that stuff has to stop. And there's no more emails that go back and forth. It, it, we need to sort of have workflows that, that kick off decisions or, or processes that might execute the classification model, right? There's got to be a trigger. The data lands in the data lake. It, it gets triggered. It gets classified. Once the classification happens, it, it should automatically send an alert to the human of the columns that it wasn't so confident of. Then that human can automatically, you know, it doesn't have to send, you know, Charlie and Pete don't have to send an email to Sheila to tell her that uh, the data is ready. So when we think about the process automation piece versus the AI piece, the AI piece is really, you know, if we think about the old construct of workflow and decisioning, the workflow is still there. We still have to automate those workflows. The decisioning piece is usually sort of where we think about the AI coming in. And, you know, just because you've got an AI model, that doesn't actually make you more efficient. Not totally, right? I mean, if you look at the example I just gave, certainly it, it made it more efficient for the person whose job was to actually look into the column of the data and say, hey, you know what, that's an address, that's a phone number, that's a whatever. That certainly made that more efficient, but it didn't actually make the process end-to-end. -end. It, it only helped so much. To actually implement that effectively and really save money and really become more efficient, you have to sort of look at how you do things and, and change the process and cut down the bottlenecks and actually sort of re-engineer the way that you do things. That's really what it is. You know, you could use AI and process automation in pretty much anything. Because generally speaking, if you go to any company and you look into their ops or you look into whatever they're doing at any sort of place in the business, there's sort of efficiencies to be gained. And if you ask those people, and I'm just talking on average, you ask those people, well, why do you do it this way? You know what they're going to tell you? That's how we've always done it. That's how Charlie told me to do it. And that's sort of the lesson is we have to, if we're going to get to that cognitive enterprise, we have to rethink the way that we do things. We have to re-engineer our processes. At the outcome, you know, you can be wildly successful and you can, you can pick up massive efficiencies, but you have to really think about how you're doing it. AI can sort of save you some time or money or make you better at one incremental thing without automation. But at some point, if you're really going to sort of get the benefits, we need to think about the end to end. Where can we use AI within this entire process? Where can we sort of change the way that we're actually doing it? And think about the end to end because AI by itself, sure, it can help. But really what we're trying to do in terms of a cognitive enterprise is, is we want to embed AI in the way that we do things and that involves the workflow, the decisions, the automation, the end-to-end -end process. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I want to ask you about the general AI, though. What, what are your vision regarding the future of the general 
artificial intelligence, how far do you think we will be able to replicate the human perception, the cognition, and the consciousness into the machine? Well, I mean, I think you, know, you ever see Star Trek, right? I mean, you see, you, you know, Commander Data. I don't think any of that stuff is far fetched, right? I mean, will we have an intelligent androids? Yeah, we will. Is it going to be tomorrow? No, it's not. You know, and certainly. We've got some work to do. I mean, I think one of my favorite areas of the broader AI field is what we call knowledge representation and reasoning. And so, what we found is, I mean, if you if you look at sort of what we've been doing a lot of in AI, we've solved a lot of really hard problems. In the past decade, deep learning networks and neural techniques have really sort of Taken us to the next level, and a lot of that is because the computational horsepower, the processing power, it's here now. And, and before, you, you know, it would have taken forever. And these things sort of go together very well, right? But we've been able to sort of solve a lot of hard problems. But when we think about an intelligent system, or you think about yourself, you know, you have some world model. You've got a concept of what the world looks like based on your experience, and so. What this comes down to is there's these sort of two fields, right? And I wish I could remember this this really great quote, but it comes down to what we call ontology or epistemology. Yeah. And what's the difference between these two things? Well, ontology is basically your view of the world. It is the existential account of all things and their relationship to other things. It's your worldview. AI models, while we have sort of done a lot with ontology. Most of what we're doing in AI hasn't involved around being able to sort of have a memory that's based on what you've learned. So the um, the epistemology construct and, and these two fields have gone back and forth forever, right? So since the beginning of, of philosophy and time. And what it comes down to is the: Do you believe that the world exists a priori? And that we could sort of build a model of all things, and that's actually how it works. There's basically a model that tells us we could build it that tells us everything, right? We know the relationships of everything a priori, and that's how it works. Or is it that there is no a priori, and that we discover these things based on evidence? And I think that's sort of you know, in some ways, it's both right. But but from a from a human or or a creature or a, a learning system. For an intelligent system, you can give it some world model, and I mean, I, I guess you'd have to think about, it. hey, when you were a baby, did you know how the world worked? Probably not. No, you learned that, and and you learned that based on your experience. So epistemologically, you're creating your worldview based on your experience, based on your observations, based on the happenstance, and so your experience creates your worldview. And since that's a continuous dynamic process, you're learning as you go on, right? It's like when you were a kid and you touched the stove and it was like, ah, oh, you burned yourself. Well, that's hot. Okay, don't do that. The stove is hot. Now I know that. Well, so now in your world model, you're going to sort of say, well, the stove is hot. If I touch it, I'm going to burn myself. So for intelligent systems, and, and so as we start to think about a general AI, just because we can sort of tell you, hey, that's Charlie in that picture, or that's a monkey, or just because I can transcribe speech to text and all, you know, all these things, that doesn't mean that I'm keeping a memory. And so that's where the knowledge representation construct is. That's a really budding area. That's why, you know, KRR, knowledge representation and reasoning, is what's going to happen over the next decade is you're going to see all of these great incremental things that we could do, the visual recognition, audio classification, you know, all these things information, all that stuff together. And we're going to be able to start to assemble an ontology or a world, a knowledge graph or a worldview that then serves as the memory or the brain of that system. And as that system experiences through sensory, you know, through whether it's a video recording or an audio recording, or it's got sensors that, right? I mean, it's just like you, you've got, you know, digits and you've got ears and you've got eyes and this is how you experience the world. So those are sensory inputs. Well, we've got sensors and we've got cameras and we've got speakers and we've got all those things, right? So in theory, you could build a system that is able to sort of take all these things and then construct some sort of 
knowledge graph or, or worldview from its experiences and then learn from those experiences and then continue that process. And so where we've come very far in our ability to do these one-off things, classify images or, you know, identify the contents of an image or, you know, like all the great things that we've actually come a very long way. And these, these were very complex problems. We can now do those pretty well. And, and there are models that, you know, look, you could go online and download them right now. They're free. But how do you take those things and how do you build on that? I mean, when we talk about general intelligence, we're really talking about, like, you're talking about data from Star Trek or Jarvis from Iron Man, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. How do we build Jarvis? Well, Jarvis has to have some sort of worldview. It's got to have some knowledge of its environment and the things around it. And so you're going to see ontology is really going to blow up over the next decade. And so that KRR aspect of it, being able to sort of build that world graph and being able to reason over that world graph and do that continuously over the life of the system that is part of what has to happen before we can build data or Jarvis. And to me, that's sort of where you're going to see a lot of activity there. And rightfully so. I mean, that's, to me, that's one of the most fascinating places of interest in AI right now. I'm curious to know, and you can choose not to answer the question, but are you involved in building IBM Watson? <laughs> well, so no, no, I guess I'd say yes and no, right? At, at some point, there's... Watson is really a collection of a number of different IBM products, mm. right? So it's sort of a brand, just like, I don't know, any other IBM brand. So there are offering management teams and development teams associated with all of these different products. So if you go into the IBM cloud and you want to use Watson speech to text, well, there's a team of people and offering managers, and there's a whole team that develops that Watson product. Okay. I, I want to be really clear about this because I think, you know, before I even worked for IBM, you know, a long time ago, I thought that Watson was really just this intelligent machine, right? It's like you see Jeopardy and you think that's Watson. It's like this personified intelligent system. It's not. It's a collection of capabilities and, and products that, that fall under a product portfolio that we call IBM Watson. Okay. Now, have I done any work that sort of influenced or gone into those products? Yes. The work that I did in the chief data office around data classification eventually found its way into the Watson Knowledge Catalog product. And, and so I, you know, in the CDO, I really came up with this notion. I called it Automated Metadata Generation, or AMG. And what was it? It was a capability for automatically classifying data. That's gone into the Watson Knowledge Catalog product since I left the group and took this role. But, you know, I think about within a year of the time I left, that work did find its way into the products that we sell. So indirectly, yeah, I mean, you know, my work, my, my baby from the time that I was in the CDO is now in a Watson product. But, you know, just to be clear, there was a lot of people that went into sort of building these capabilities, right? And so certainly, you know, I had a, a big hand in that, but but I, I don't want to sort of overplay that hand, right? I, I want to be clear is, you know, it took a village. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. I mean, absolutely. And thanks for clarifying that. I, I think it helps to, it helps a lot of people to put that into the perspective about what IBM Watson is and how is it a collection of so many things. How far do you think Watson can go and can do in the future? Look, I mean, I guess what I would say, right, and it's going to sound maybe cheesy a little bit, but it's really actually what I believe is I don't think there is a limit, right? I mean, at some point, Watson is a collection of AI machine learning capabilities that were built by humans. And if I were to sort of put a limit and say, hey, it can only go this far, well, in many ways, what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm putting a limit on how far humans are going to be able to go, right? I mean, oh, since mankind's existed, and then we were cavemen, and we invented the wheel and, and fire, and we've come a long way, constantly building on and standing on the, the, the shoulders of giants. And I think that's how it always works, right, is 
you know, you're, you're going to have some really brilliant people. And there's a lot of them at IBM. There, there's a lot of them at, at other companies. And, and humans are smart. I believe in humanity. I, I, I bet we will get very far. You know, and that's my belief. So, you know, how far can Watson go? Well, how far can we go? Because it's, it's sure, it's a, you know, it's a product. It's an advanced product and it does some cool stuff. But to say that it's, it's got limits, inherently what, what you're saying is that we are limited as a species and we're not going to be able to get there. Certainly if we can, and there's a reason and a need for, you know, any of anything, someone can make a product out of it and put it out there for people to consume. And, and I, I feel that way about Watson, right? It, it's sure it's a brand, but if there's a need for it, it will always be able to evolve to sort of satisfy that need. And that's just the human element. People are brilliant. Good stuff. So I would end this interview with my usual question, which is, what is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? And why is this book? Well, I, you know, there's really so many. You know, at, at some point, I'm, um, I would describe myself as a knowledge weasel. I'm always sort of looking for, I want to learn new things and I want to read about new stuff and, and interesting stuff and figure out, I really just want to know how the world works. Do you know what I mean? I think if we were to sort of narrow that down and we were to sort of say, what is a, what is a book that I think is extremely fundamental and valuable for people that want to sort of excel in the data or AI field? Well, you know, again, there, there's a couple. But I, I think that the most, I think the best one that folks could read, it, it's an O'Reilly book. And it's from a guy named Martin Kleppman. It's called Designing Data Intensive Applications. The Big Ideas Behind Reliable, Scalable, and Maintainable Systems. I've not actually seen a better book than this book. Because a lot of this stuff, right? I mean, at least for me, I didn't sort of study this in school, right? I didn't go to school for computer science. I didn't study data science in school. I, I'm a self-taught practitioner. So for me, this book was really quite influential for me because even if you're sort of a computer or a Linux geek or whatever, distributed systems is, is complicated. And, and if you want to build data-driven systems, you want them to work and you want to be able to sort of figure out how do I do AI on top of that? This is a, just a fantastic book for anybody that wants to be in this field. And, you know, it's actually something that I, I buy all of my interns and all of my, my juniors. I personally buy them a copy of this book and I, and I give it to them and, and ask them to read it because it, it, it was that influential for me and it made that much of a difference for me. And I couldn't recommend it highly enough to, to any of your listeners that, that want to be data scientists or data engineers or, you know, really just want an understanding of this field and, and some of the systems that we're building. I think if you could get through this book, you'd have a, a, a really great appreciation for what we're building and, and why things are the way they are. Wonderful. I will have to link up to this book as well. So thank you so much, Michael, for this great interview and really appreciate of sharing your knowledge about the connective enterprise transformation and also your thought about the AI and how it is heading and what is happening in this space. I uh, really enjoyed it. Well, no, look, I, absolutely. And I apologize. It took us so long to get together, Jason. I know that we've been planning on doing this for, for some time. I was glad that we were able to connect today and, you know, I had a good time chatting with you. So I, uh, thanks to all the listeners. Uh, appreciate the invite and uh, thanks for the talk. No problem for that. Thank you, Michael.